Who are you? When you gaze into a mirror and lock eyes with this odd, hairless ape, who is this ape that you see? Is this a social ape? Or a shy ape? Is this ape polite and compassionate? Or is this ape cold and callous, with little regard for those around him? Does this ape carefully categorize and order the world it inhabits, or does this ape dissolve and destroy those categories and boxes? There is indeed a great diversity in the personality characteristics of the Homo sapien, and we all vary in terms of these idiosyncratic traits and dispositions. We can think of the study of personality as one lens through which we can look at human individual differences, and one method of categorizing human variants. And whilst these categories of personality can't fully explain or predict behavior, they can help contribute to this scientific project of human self-understanding, this mission of understanding who we are as these apes confronted by the cosmos. So there is this extreme range that a human being can take. And I suppose this is captured in the countless numbers of mental disorders that humans can fall victim to. An incredibly complex system, which is of course what we are, will have the ability to take on a huge spectrum of forms, but the corollary of this is that there are a substantial number of ways in which this system can go wrong. Now, I want to leave this topic of psychopathology for a later episode, but it's important to see how there is a relation between this and the study of personality. Some psychological disorders, for instance, can be interpreted as extreme forms of particular personality dimensions, and some psychological or personality disorders can be conceived as a specific combination of certain personality characteristics. If we take the neuroticism personality dimension, which I will elaborate further on in the episode when I encountered a big five factor model of personality, scoring very highly on this particular dimension can be a reliable marker of certain anxiety or depressive disorders which of course makes sense if we consider this dimension, this neuroticism dimension, as a measure of how sensitive one is to a negative motion. In addition, if we think of our personalities as being the formation of our own unique cocktail of traits and dispositions, those who are more, say, sociopathic or narcissistic among us will have their own distinctive flavour to their personality cocktail, and it is these maladaptive flavours, these flavours which predispose one to cause suffering to themselves or to others, which psychologists identify as personality disorders. So really, this study of personality goes beyond the generalities of behaviour that we all share and it engages with the unique features of each individual. Whilst we all share the commonality of being vertebrate mammals with incredibly sophisticated nervous systems, the exact composition of this nervous system will vary considerably at the micro level when comparing one person to another. This is the world of neurons and neurotransmitters, axons and dendrites, the overly complex world of neurobiology which we need not bother ourselves with at the moment because you will probably stop listening. Differences at this micro layer will naturally manifest in differences at the micro macro layer, this macro layer being the entire behaviour of the organism in question. When we're talking about atoms and molecules, neurons and neurotransmitters and psychological modules and personality types, really what we are talking about are different layers of explaining the system, different resolutions of measurement, 
we can zoom in and we can zoom out when we're trying to understand the weird monkeys that we are. So it's important to think of personality as emergent from these lower levels of explanation. And given the sheer complexity of all of these lower levels, from that follows complexity in this personality layer. Now, for the sake of this podcast episode, I want to focus on what personality psychologists call the Big Five model. This is essentially five major personality dimensions in which human beings vary somewhere across. It is just one way, really, of grouping the different traits that humans can take on. And whilst it's not a comprehensive taxonomy for categorising personality, for our purposes, I feel it's still very important and informative and it really helps us when we're trying to understand ourselves when we embark on this courageous journey of self-discovery and self-knowledge. Now, before I continue, there's one crucial thing to consider with personality research and this is the fact that it is almost entirely self-report data. These personality models are typically derived from the responsive to personality questionnaires. It's really very difficult to set up an experiment or a laboratory experiment to assess personality, so many researchers are really forced to rely on this form of data. And if you imagine yourself filling out a personality quiz, your answers probably aren't going to be a truthful reflection, really, of who you are. Your answers are more likely to reflect the story that you tell yourself about who you are, which is obviously vulnerable to all sorts of biases and distortions. We all have, really, a particular idea of who we are and who we want to be, and this idea isn't infallible. It can't be perfectly accurate. Indeed, the whole ideal of perfect self-knowledge is basically impossible to attain and this problem means that whatever result you ever get from a personality test or quiz it doesn't tell you what your quote-unquote true personality is but rather tells you about the story or the narrative that you construct for yourself and this construction is captured in the particular answers you choose for the questionnaire items. Now, with those caveats out the way, let us now take a look through this big five taxonomy and see what these five major dimensions are. The first dimension I want to take a look at is the introversion-extroversion dimension. This measures really how sociable you are, your preference between spending time alone or with other people, how much parties invigorate or terrify you. Extroverts will tend to be energised by large-scale social gatherings, while this prospect would probably induce great anxiety in the more introverted among you. One interesting way of conceiving this difference between introverts and extroverts is through looking at how psychologically rewarding they each find social interaction. Now, contrary to what most would assume, Introverts actually tend to find social interaction much more fulfilling and rewarding when compared to extroverts. Now, this is very surprising. I was quite surprised when I first read this. In fact, sparse social engagement will in fact produce more dopamine in an introvert when compared to an extrovert, which means that the introvert will be quite motivated to engage socially but they will also be satiated from this interaction much sooner than the extrovert. If we use hunger as an analogy, the extrovert has much more social hunger than the introvert and so needs much more social engagement before they feel socially satiated. And this is down to each individual social interaction releasing relatively less dopamine for the extrovert compared to the introvert. So rather than conceptualising extroversion and introversion as being a dimension of how chatty or quiet you are, it's probably more accurate to think of it as a measure 
of how much social engagement one needs to bring their social homeostasis into balance to achieve that social satiety. Let us now move on to our second factor in the Big Five model. And this factor is what's known as openness to experience. It is essentially a measure of how imaginative and creative one is. It indicates how open-minded a person is, how curious they are. Individuals who are low in this measure, in low in openness to experience, would rather not try new things. You can think of this dimension as capturing the, the extent to which one seeks novelty, how exploratory one is, whether in the physical realm or the, the realm of ideas. This dimension of openness to experience is also a solid predictor of political orientation. Political liberals will tend to score much higher than conservatives in this particular dimension, which makes sense when we consider how those two orientations differ in their intuition, say, to change, particularly social change. The liberal will typically advocate for change and reform and will reject the status quo. They are much more open to new ideas and novel methods of changing society and solving problems, whereas the conservative has a particular disposition to be averse to change, to be steeped in traditional value systems. They would rather not rock the boat too hard for risk or potentially drowning. So here we see this intimate connection between personality and political orientation notably the way in which our personality informs our politics. This relationship becomes more apparent when we conceive of personality as a model for orientation in the world. When we conceive of personality as a model for how one engages with their environment and also for what to value in their environment. Take someone scoring high on extroversion. They will tend to have a, uh, a tendency to view the world as a realm of social opportunity, as a place to engage and interact with other people. Someone who is highly neurotic will perceive the world as a place of threat and danger, and their attention will likely be oriented to potential stresses much more so than other people people high in openness will conceive of the world as a landscape of ideas, as an unexplored jungle that needs to be mapped. Our personalities in some sense orients our perceptual frame of the world. It biases our attention to particular elements of our surroundings, whether it be threats or social opportunities. So if personality biases the things we focus our attention on, it therefore structures the hierarchy of a value that we impose upon the world. And this is because our attention is necessarily discriminatory. When we attend to one thing, we consequently neglect many other things. So, a bias to attend to one thing amongst many things is really a frame for valuing one thing over another. So when we develop this conceptual understanding of personality as a perceptual frame, through which we determine what to value and how to interact with the world, it becomes almost self-evident that our personality will bias our political perceptual frame to a certain degree. Leaving political psychology aside, let's move on to our next personality dimension, which is the conscientiousness dimension. Now, this dimension captures how one engages with their work or their duties. It is a measure of how careful or diligent one is when engaging with the task or when fulfilling their obligations. Conscientious people tend to be highly efficient and orderly as opposed to being easygoing or laid back. They tend to show great self-restraint and a profound motivation to complete their duties and to fulfill what's required of them. They are far less spontaneous than those who are regarded as unconscientious and are much more likely to carefully plan out their actions. 
their duty-bound nature tends also to make them far more dependable people. And unsurprisingly, how conscientious one is does seem to be a very good predictor of lifetime success alongside intelligence. It also helps to predict academic performance alongside intelligence as well, and it's also a personality trait that is highly regarded amongst military personnel which is obviously a domain that places high importance of being able to fulfill one's orders or duties. So naturally this is a personality trait that carries a great significance in many, many facets of life. Moving on, our next dimension to consider is the agreeableness dimension. And agreeableness manifests itself in the characteristics that we consider to be kind, empathetic and compassionate. Someone scoring low in agreeableness will be predisposed to pr prioritise their own interests above others, whilst highly con agreeable people are considered much more altruistic and cooperative. Agreeableness can be conceived as a measure of how you orient yourself in the social domain as whether you see the social world as a domain of competition or cooperation. A low agreeableness score would indicate an inclination towards competing with others and therefore more selfishness and a lack of empathy towards other people. On the other hand, whereas the opposite will be true of high scorers, who tend to orient themselves for the benefit of others as opposed to themselves, when asked to describe themselves, agreeable people would tend to describe themselves in terms of their social relationships and the social circles they engage with, whereas disagreeable people focus more on their own individual achievements and their own distinctive qualities as an individual. Interestingly, if you ask someone who is extremely agreeable what they themselves want, they may struggle to really give you a coherent answer, since often they don't actually know what they want, since they are so strongly orientated towards the wants of others as opposed to the wants of themselves. The last personality dimension I want to take us through now is what's called the neuroticism dimension. There are many ways to define this dimension, but as I've touched upon earlier, we can think of it as one's sensitivity to negative emotion. It can be regarded as the tendency for fast arousal when responding to stimulation, and a slow easing from arousal when a stimulation is no longer present. Individuals with high scores for neuroticism are much more likely than average to be moody and to experience such feelings as, and I'm quoting here from Wikipedia, feelings such as anxiety, worry, fear, anger, frustration, envy, loneliness, etc. So yeah, clearly scoring high in neuroticism is not all sunshine and rainbows. Now how neurotic or threat sensitive a particular person is could probably be attributed partly to how the limbic structures in their brain function, notably a brain region called the amygdala. You can conceptualize the limbic system in our brain as broadly dictating our emotional and behavioral drives. And if, if you've ever felt that internal surge of tension and hyper alertness when you perceive something potentially threatening, then you know how it feels for your amygdala and your stress response to activate. Whether that stressor is a serial killer trying to murder you or a jump scare in a horror movie, there will be this similar physiological stress response and the amygdala with its involvement in threat detection and fear learning will be paramount in this response. The extent to which the amygdala and these threat circuits activate when encountering a particular stimulus 
will typically determine the intensity of the behavioural response. So you can think of your own sensitivity to fear and negative emotion as being in some ways causally determined by the tendency of these brain circuits to fire. If your amygdala is highly sensitive, then you're perhaps a highly anxious individual. Your amygdala is much more prone to fire in response to particular stresses in the environment and as a result you're highly strung out. You can be thrust into the state of psychological chaos with the most innocuous of stimuluses. And conversely, if the opposite of true and you have a highly insensitive amygdala, then you share a common trait with sociopaths, that is, an inability to perceive threat in your environment. In fact, very low amygdala activation is a reliable marker of sociopathy according to various brain scan studies which have been conducted on sociopaths. For instance, from a paper in 2008 by Hastings et al., it was found that fearful facial expressions don't elicit an amygdala response from sociopaths, whereas in psychologically typical populations this region will tend to fire in response to fearful expressions. For sociopaths there is a sense of indifference to the fear displays of others, and this is perhaps a consequence of a highly insensitive threat detection, detection circuit, and it is this dysfunctional brain region that is likely a major reason for the callous insensitivity to the fear of others, which characterises a lot of how we understand sociopathy. When we're talking about this neuroticism dimension, it isn't just the activation of these emotional limbic structures that characterise this personality dimension, but there is also a role for what's known as the frontal cortex, now, an in-depth discussion of the frontal cortical function would take us far beyond the purview of this episode, but for our purposes we can see it as the seat of our higher order thinking. It dictates much of our ability to plan and engage in abstract thought, but crucially it has an important role in inhibition. Imagine you're on a nice morning stroll and you're suddenly startled by a stick that looks very similar to a snake. Now when this happens, when this occurs, you're engaging in a particular fear response. You're probably going to jump out in response to the stick. You're probably feeling that little inner surge of tension, inner surge of anxiety. You're probably very startled. However, when you realise that it is just a stick, there will be this damping down of the stress response as you begin to relax and ease, and this will be partially due to inhibitory impulses coming from your frontal cortex, essentially telling your stress response circuits in your brain to chill out bro, there is no danger here. The important thing really to consider here is that we all have different frontal lobes and therefore differing capacities when it comes to regulating our internal and external states. One way of thinking about the role of the frontal cortex is that it restricts our impulse to eat that extra biscuit or watch that next episode. Essentially it encourages us to do the harder but ultimately more beneficial thing. Naturally, the regulatory capacity of one's frontal cortex, its ability to inhibit particular neural circuits, will likely correspond with where they stand on this neuroticism personality dimension which we've just been discussing. Someone with, say, a relatively high functioning frontal cortex will be more able to inhibit various emotional impulses and thus will likely fall on the more emotionally stable end of this dimension. Conversely, those with a poorly functioning frontal cortex will have a decrease inhibitory capacity. Such people are more likely to be impulsive, 
anxious and emotionally unstable and thus they will find themselves more likely to be on the opposite end of this personality dimension. Interestingly also, during brain development, the frontal lobes tend to be the last place to become fully formed and myelinated, which only really occurs around the age of 25. When we enter our teenage years, we tend to see an acceleration of the development of our brain, particularly with respect to our emotional limbic structures. However, the development of the frontal lobes tends to lag behind the development of the limbic system. So when entering adolescence, we essentially become a, a neural ticking time bomb with a highly functional limbic system coupled with an undeveloped frontal cortex, which probably explains a lot behind the high emotionality, impulsivity and risk-taking behaviour that typically characterises adolescence. Now, I'm going to bring this episode to a close here, since I'm aware I've covered a lot of information, but the important thing to take away is really this idea of personality as a perceptual frame that guides action in the world. Different personalities will engage with the world in differing manners, prioritising certain things above other things. And understanding your own personality in this sense can carry great utility when trying to decide how you should conduct your own life. Having some knowledge of your own traits and dispositions can help inform what jobs to pursue, what relationships to form and what friends to make. You don't want to be operating at odds with your own personality, but rather you want to harmonise your personality with your environment. An introvert whose job, say, demands extensive social engagement is not as harmonised as an extrovert in that particular situation, for instance. And really, having this synergy or harmony between yourself and your environment will help to reduce really many potential sources of conflict in your life and it is this which I feel is an important component for striving towards psychological well-being. Thank you for listening.